Why should the, this have happened specifically in modern culture? Isn't it part of the human condition as such? It, it is part in, in the sense that man is a being who flies away from truth even as he pursues it. But I think one of the reasons it happens specifically in modern culture is, of course, we, we build up a much more intricate technical society. We're more encased in the sheer human framework of things than people were at one well, time. Simply because we live in a much more complex, complicated right. We live surrounding. in an air-conditioned nightmare, to borrow mm. the mm. term mm. of Henry Miller. But we live more and more in a, a man-created environment, if we consider it all down the line from our yeah. air conditioning yeah. to everything else. And our urban complexes, I mean, I can't help but think, coming to London, that the, London is a very different city from Shakespeare's London, which existed that much closer to the countryside. You could probably, yeah. you know, very shortly walk out. And yeah, so. yeah. Well, what are the main themes, then, of the later Heidegger, as distinct from the earlier? Yes, well, you see, the later Heidegger is, is not systematic, or not even systematic in, in the way in which he attempts to be in being in time. The later Heidegger is primarily, or not primarily, but very centrally concerned with the problem of poetry and art. And in some sense, you see, and, and the problem of technology. Um, <clears throat> Heidegger feels that, or felt since he's, he's dead now, the, um, one of the uh, tasks of philosophers in, 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 in this period is to try to think through what technology involves. He felt that I think modern thinking is either too superficial, too in, inauthentic with regard to the subject of technology. You know, on the one hand, you find people very flippant attitude, they're against machines or they're for technology. It makes no sense, he said, for man at this particular juncture of history to be for or against technology. We're obviously committed to technology. I mean, if you removed it, the whole thing would collapse. We are. That's, that's part of the stake of our existence. It's part of our gamble. On the other hand, you see, there is a point which I think the atomic bomb has brought forth for human consciousness generally, that technology has drastic possibilities. It's hitherto people have protested against it as local nuisances or causing unemployment, sabotage, and so on. But the notion that suddenly mankind could self-destruct suddenly showed us the, the fearful possibilities within the, the technical complex. And now he, Heidegger was concerned with thinking through where in the historical destiny of man the, the roots of, of his technical being lie, lies and where it may possibly be carrying him. But how does, how does his concern with poetry relate to his concern with technology? Unless he sees these yeah. as two opposite sides of the opposite. same kind. They are kind. opposite. Yeah. Because uh, the thing, well, as you, you well know from other branches of contemporary philosophy, there's a certain disposition on the part of some philosophers when they're examining language to treat it as a calculus. It's an instrument which can be manipulated and controlled. It's a formal calculus and so on. And in this sense, this represents an extension of technical thinking, you see, even to the domain of language. Now, the thing about a, a poem in Heidegger's view is that it eludes uh, the demands of our will. We cannot, the poet cannot will to write a poem. He cannot will it. It comes. And actually, we as his readers can't will our response. We have to submit to it and be passive to it. You see, along, what Heidegger connects the, the technological uh, scent of this civilization is with its Faustian will, which becomes eventually the Nietzsche will, Which goes right will, back the will again to, to man, man's determination right. to master nature, right. which is the basis of our whole modern exactly. culture, modern exactly. technology, modern science, and so on, which yes, he is in rebellion against. And, and if I, if I, I think the key quotation here would be Francis Bacon. We must learn, who oh, oh, is, uh, I'm really a prophet of the new science in this respect. Mm. I always think of Bacon in this respect as being um, a publicity man for the new science, but a publicity man of genius. He says, we must put nature to the rack to compel it to answer our questions, which is a very d d dramatic way of, of endorsing the experimental method. But now you stop to think, you know, even if we put poor nature to the rack, poor tortured nature, we have to listen <laughs> to our responses. Mm -hmm. We have, in some sense, to give ourselves a receptive. There's a point at which mm -hmm. our twisting 
you see, has to submit to, to whatever is there to be. This really does represent a basic uh, break with, with the tradition, doesn't it? Because even, as it were, revolutionary philosophies within the tradition, like Marxism, for example, take it for granted that the conquest of nature is man's business. Mm -hmm. It's what human life is all about and right. what social life right. is all about. I must say that, speaking just purely personally for a yes. moment, that in uh, all the uh, preparation that this television series has involved me in, the preparation I've done for this discussion and this program has taught me most because uh, I've found in Heidegger, who I knew very little about before, all kinds of illuminating insights in these very fundamental themes mm -hmm. we've been discussing. And that being so, this is leading me to the point I want to put to you, I can't help wondering why it is that other philosophers, including very able and prestigious ones like A.J. Mm -hmm. Eyre mm -hmm. or Karl Popper or Rudolf Carnap, mm -hmm. all sorts of people, pour scorn on Heidegger and the kind of philosophy that he's trying to do. They dismiss it, they've dismissed it in their published writings as nonsense, rubbish, garbage, it's all a lot of rhetoric, it's all mm -hmm. a lot of words. Yes. It seems to me you've only got to read the stuff for five minutes mm -hmm. to see that it isn't yeah. just all a lot of words. Now, why has it been so derisively dismissed by so many such able people? Well, I don't want to make an invidious remark about a philosophy in the state of philosophy, but there is a certain kind of professional deformation. A, a, a man has a certain vision, and he carries with this uh, sort of blindness to somebody else's mm -hmm. uh, vision. Uh, I think one of the things is that Heidegger's vo vocabulary, you see, is, is um, initially rather uh, jarring. You see. And, uh, but if, I think if you read him in German, he writes a fairly straightforward German. And uh, if, certainly if you compare his, him as a, uh, his German prose with that, let's say, of Hegel, it seems to me Heidegger's lucidity itself. But um, I, I think what we do find in philosophy is that uh, there's a certain prejudice for certain chosen vocabularies. Now, you mentioned Carnap. I was a student of Carnap for several years, you say. And, and I think. I got an interest in partly in Heidegger to find out what the fuss was. Could he be as bad as they said? What you came to Heidegger through Carnap's attacks on Heidegger. Right. Yes. Right. Yes. And uh, yes. And, uh, and when you read Heidegger, you discovered that I he got wasn't as bad as they yes. said. Yes. 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 But. Tell, uh, Professor Barrett, uh, in, when I was introducing this program, I promised our viewers that we would say something about Sartre. And yes. I think that before we come to an end, I, I, I really do want to uh, ask you if, you if we can move on to him just yes. for a moment. Um, although Sartre has become, as it were, the most famous existentialist, his is the name that most people associate with existentialism, mm -hmm. he's not as original a thinker as Heidegger, is he? But nevertheless, he has made a contribution. What would you characterize as being Sartre's main contribution? Well, there are a number of ways uh, which you can characterize that, but I'd like to contrast them first. Perhaps that might perhaps point the direction which his, his um, contribution has come. This is Sartre's uh, big book, his major philosophical work. And I personally think, by the way, some of his novels and plays are more important than, than any of his philosophical writing. But I think he's a, still a philosopher of considerable brilliance. But his major work is called Being and Nothingness. It's a gigantic misnomer. Um, it's not about being, and it's not about nothingness. Uh, Sartre doesn't have much of a feeling for being. Whatever, whatever one may object to in the Heidegger, one has to acknowledge that man is really saturated with the sense of being in some sense. What Sartre's book is, is about is really the kind of melodrama of two Cartesian consciousnesses. And naturally, they are Cartesian because he's French. Every Frenchman is a Cartesian, I think, when he's, he's pushed far enough. And these, these two consciousnesses never understand each other. That is, they are two subjectivistic minds uh, who misinterpret each other. I, as subject, impose upon you and convert you into an object and so on, and you reciprocate. And so this fiendish dialogue of misrepresentation goes on, of misunderstanding and so forth. In the end, it becomes impossible for us to communicate sin sincerely. This big book of Sartre is really a book on the problem of sincerity, which is the staple, I think, of French literature from 
Montaigne, right through Moliere mm -hmm. and Proust and so on. Now, the, but to come to, to, you see, Sartre's then most famous positive doctrine is its notion of, of liberty, and it's the doctrine which actually, I think, caught on most in public art. That as, as human beings, we have an absolute and total freedom. Nothing prevents us at a certain moment from, for, from doing some very precipitous well, I am and dangerous thing. I am in the literal sense free now to take all my clothes off or right. go and jump out of the window. Right. Or I can actually yes. do these yes. things. Yes. And one thing Sartre keeps stressing is that by pretending that I am not free to do them, I'm falsifying the reality right. of my own situation. Yeah. So I stand on a precipice at any moment and I can hurl myself mm -hmm. off it. And in this sense, the characteristic of this total freedom is that it's, <clears throat> it's vertiginous or dizzying. And he, he carries through this metaphor of standing on a cliff and having this dizzy sense of being able to cast yourself down. Nothing right, prevents you. Isn't he right to dramatize in this way the fact that the realities of choice which we have in yes. life and the realities yes. of freedom that we have in life are in fact much greater than we ourselves wish to yes. face for most of the time? Except now here's where you see I think Heidegger has an insight which is beyond be him in this respect because the individual who hurls himself into this precipitous choice may, in tearing off in that sudden direction, be, remain utterly as blind as when he started. You see, now, it's rather curious that Heidegger's view of our freedom is a very quiet one and, and subtle and soft. It, our fundamental freedom is the freedom, if we can manage it, to become open, to let truth happen. And, uh, most of us in our lives are, are shut off in our personal lives in one way or another, doesn't mm. matter which, mm. from uh, truth in our dealings with other people. We have uh, resistances which can't be breached and so on. But sometimes there is a fissure in this wall that shuts us off and we are able to let be. We no longer seek to compel. Or, or. You see, the whole of he the later Heidegger is really a prolonged attack on the will to power as characterizing Western civilization. An attack on this, this urge yes. we have to dominate nature. Right. And even, dominate our environment. And even the, dominate our own personal lives or dominate yes. other people. The view being that you only really understand reality when in some sense you submit yourself to right. it. Yes. Summing up, Professor Barrett, taking Heidegger and Sartre and indeed the whole existentialist mm. tradition together, if you were asked to say, well, now, what contribution has this made to human thought in our time, mm -hmm. what would you stress? What have we got from it all? I'll, I'll, I'll stress an academic point f first, and then the more important human <laughs> point following. I think um, from the point of view of the history of thought or the history of philosophy, uh, existentialism has brought forward a kind of re-evaluation of 19th century thought. For one thing, it, it has exhumed Kierkegaard, who was virtually unknown in English-speaking uh, countries. It's established him as a, as a major thinker. I don't know whether you'd call him a philosopher, but a thinker of, of considerable proportions and power in the 19th, one of the major figures of the, of the century. As a matter of fact, Wittgenstein said of Kierkegaard, he thought he was the greatest writer of the 19th century, which is rather mm -hmm. interesting. Kierke um, Wittgenstein had discovered Kierkegaard quite early, before existentialism, uh, in, in, toward the end of the World War I. But um, the second point I think that's made aware of, uh, made people aware of the fact that uh, modern society tends to depersonalize to a certain extent, that we it gets larger and larger, more intricately organized, and so on. And that the problem of the person, the individual, as a unique being who cannot be completely assimilated into any framework, whether it's bureaucratic or conceptual or systematic, something of him is left out. I think this, is, this kind of emphasis is what uh, it, 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 it has brought forward, I think, most powerfully. Thank you very much, Professor Barrett.